Thank you to the Jewish Heritage Museum. Thanks to uh, Jean Clerman and the board for uh, inviting me to give these talks. So this is the third and the last uh, of the um, lectures that I'm giving on the varieties of Zionism. And I should say right away, I, I notice in looking at my screen that I originally gave this as a series of four lectures. So please don't be dismayed by the fact that my first slide here says part four. Um, you haven't missed anything. I, I combined parts one and two uh, for the Jewish Heritage Museum into a single lecture. So this is the third and final lecture. And um, today I'm going to be talking about um, three different varieties of Zionism that have existed um, since the earliest days of the Zionist movement, religious Zionism, Christian Zionism, and binational Zionism. So, um, oops, sorry, I'm trying to get my, uh, so um, as, as, I, as I hope um, may be evident from earlier talks that I gave um, in this series, uh, religious Zionism, this variety of Zionism I'm going to be leading off with, um, in, the, in the larger sort of mainstream of Zionism, religious Zionism is almost a kind of oxymoron in the sense that um, uh, the, the, the founders, the, the most influential founders of the Zionist movement and its most influential leaders from its earliest days were um, thoroughgoing secularists and the mainstream of Zionism um, really, at least in its early days and even down to the present day, um, the mainstream of Zionism has always fallen within secular parameters. Um, and if we go back to the early uh, period of Zionism, the, the late 19th, early 20th century, um, Zionism was not looked upon favorably by the majority of Jewish religious authorities. Um, indeed, um, for the majority of, of, of rabbis, for the majority of especially the Ashkenazic rabbinate, um, Zionism, to the extent that they were aware of it, was really anathema. Um, and if you, if you review the writings and the pronouncements, the evidence we have of the, the attitudes of rabbis um, in the late 19th and early 20th century to Zionism, uh, there's a great deal of hostility. So I've, I've chosen two examples to give you. These are two of many. Um, Yosef Dov Sol, uh, Soloveitchik um, and um, Rabbi Chaim Soloveitchik. These were uh, a, a rabbinic dynasty in Eastern Europe. And um, I, two, two of their statements that they made concerning the Zionist movement. Um, you can see on the top, Yosef Dov Soloveitchik said, the Zionists are now a sect like that of Shabbatai uh, Tzvi, may the names of evildoers rot. And his son, Chaim Soloveitchik said, uh, 10 years later, the people of Israel, and here, of course, he just means the Jews. He's not talking about the people of Israel, the place. The people of Israel should take care not to join a venture that threatens their souls to destroy religion and is a stumbling block to the house of Israel. You know, uh, comparing a group to Shabbatai Tzvi and his followers um, in 1889, that was as about as bad an insult as one could levy at, at a group of Jews um, that one could come up with before the advent of the Nazi party. Um, Shabbatai Tzvi and his followers were the worst heretics. Um, so this is typical of the attitudes of Jewish religious authorities to the Zionist movement um, in the early days of uh, the founding of the major institutions of, of Zionism. Um, now, that, that being said, it, you know, it, it's important to acknowledge that though uh, the majority of religious Jews were adamantly opposed to Zionism and, and viewed it with um, hostility and contempt, there were religious Zionists from the very earliest days of the movement. Um, one of the most influential was this man, Rabbi Isaac Jacob Rains. Um, he was uh, an influential sort of early Zionist theologian and political activist. Um, here's a, a typical example of one of his writings. 
a fundamental basis of faith is to believe in the return of the people of Israel in their land. Nationalism then is the central foundation of Jewish faith, the belief that the Holy One, blessed be he, will give the land to his children, instills a strong feeling of belonging between Israel and the land. So, you know, uh, Reigns is making this argument, making a very kind of robust argument that um, Zionism is not in any way incompatible with Jewish religious life. You can believe in Torah. Um, you can also believe in um, uh, a return uh, to the land of Israel and, and the establishment of a kind of Jewish homeland. Um, you know, it has to be, you know, one thing, the, the, the theological basis on which um, rabbis like the Soloveitchiks were condemning Zionism uh, was a, a sort of a pretext that went back to really the time of um, Maimonides, which was, uh, the, what, what most Orthodox Jewish theologians had, had held to since Maimonides' time was, well, the only time when there's going to be a sovereign Jewish government again is in the time of the Messiah. So if one acknowledges that the Messiah is not here yet, and you are contemplating the reestablishment of Jewish sovereignty, you're a heretic. Um, and, you know, what, what Reigns was saying is, well, no, 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 that's not, that's not necessarily true that we can, we can, in some sense, contemplate the restoration of Jewish sovereignty in pre-Messianic times. You know, we, it doesn't, saying that we're ready to establish a Jewish homeland doesn't make us a heretic like Shabbatai Tzvi. Um, but that was a controversial position. Um, and and Reigns was, was ostracized by other rabbis for making this position. Um, now, that being said, he founded a number of very influential religious Zionist uh, institutions um, that remain robust to this day. He founded this party known as Hamidrahi. Hamidrahi was uh, both a pun and an and an acronym. The the letters uh, of of, Hamid, of Midrahi are uh, an acronym for the Hebrew phrase Merkaz Ruhami, uh, which or Ruhani. Which, which means the religious center, uh, but also Midrahi is the name of Jews who, are, uh, who live in you know, North Africa and Asia who are not non-Sephardic. Non-Sephardic Jews who live in places like Iraq are called Mizrahi. So um, this is both an acronym and a pun. And as an acronym, it meant the religious center party. Uh, as a pun, it meant, well, by moving to uh, Palestine, we're all becoming, we're, we're not really Ashkenazim anymore, we're Mizrahi. Um, and uh, uh, Mizrahi went through, you know, there, there are parties uh, in Israel today that continue to hold seats in the Knesset that consider themselves sort of the, the latter day legates of the Mizrahi party. So this, this trend in um, Zionist politics has been um, a, active since the earliest days, since the time of Theodore Herzl and the, uh, the days of the first Zionist Congress. Another organization which uh, Reigns helped founded was called B'nai Akiva. This was uh, a religious Zionist youth organization that set up schools and camps and summer activities and sporting events. Um, and B'nai Akiva remains robust and active today. So these are, these are all institutions that um, have been part of the fabric of the religious Zionist movement um, since, since its earliest days. Um, here's another example. So the, you know, one thing that one has to stress about the religious Zionist movement is that it's like the Zionist movement as a whole, it's internally very diverse. Um, it's wrong to paint all religious Zionists with a single brush. Uh, eventually, I'm going to get around to talking about some of the most uh, influential and some of the most controversial um, groups within the religious Zionist movement. But no one group within the religious Zionist movement fairly represents the, the movement as a whole. So here's an example of um, one of the, the diverse elements within the religious Zionist movement. This is a party called Hapoel Hamidrahi. So this was an offshoot of the Midrahi movement, which aligned itself very closely with the labor party. Um, 
And most of the early religious parties were allies of labor. They, they would vote as a, as a coalition bloc with labor in uh, elections for the, the, Z the Zionist Congress. Um, but this party uh, sort of went even further than that and sort of said, well, we're, we're a kind of you know, religious socialist party. <laughs> um, and I mean, it's interesting, right, that uh, you can see they've done a, in their iconography here, they've done a, a sort of a, um, a spin on the, the Leninist Holy Trinity. Instead of uh, soldier, worker, farmer, they have soldier on the left, worker on the right, and in the middle, I don't know if you can see, that's, <laughs> that's Moses. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and you, you see the legend at the top, Torah, labor, Eretz Yisrael, you know, presumably the soldier represents Eretz Yisrael and the worker represents labor. And Moses is there, you know, he's representing Torah. But again, the idea here being that a commitment to, to, to either socialism or to Zionism is not incompatible with uh, a commitment to Torah and a, and a devotion to Jewish religious life. Um, so, and I know this is one thing I keep, I, I, I keep coming back to the stained glass window that um, is, is at the Congregation B'nai Israel. Uh, and forgive me if I'm, if I'm beating the proverbial dead horse, but I think in any discussion of religious Zionism, it's important to sort of note that in, in certain respects, diaspora Zionism, especially uh, American Zionism, manifests itself as a kind of religious Zionism. So, you know, if we look at the iconography of this window and, and the way it's, it's showing this outline of Jewish history, beginning with Moshe and David and Shlomo, and then extending up, because this is part of one continuous window. I, I couldn't fit the whole window into one shot, but as the window continues, right, we move from uh, Shlomo up to uh, Ben Gurion, Herzl, and, and or, or Chaim Weizmann. They're, they're sort of out of order. But, you know, this presentation of this, this continuity to somebody like Ben Gurion, especially, and I think to Theodore Herzl, would be really strange, right? You're calling me the, the, the latter day continuation of, of Moshe, you know. Uh, ben Gurion doesn't even really believe in God, <laughs> much less Torah. So, um, and Herzl, he's ready to lock our priests in our temples, right? And he's a very secular character. So, you know, for and and I think that you know, look, th there's nothing all that exotic about this. Why why are Amer why are American Jews prone to interpret the past this way? Um, and I think it's just a function of the history of Zionism here in the United States. And then many American Jews were largely unaware of Zionism until, uh, for many of them, long after the founding of the state of Israel, um, Zionism really, really only comes onto the radar of American Jews after the Six Day War uh, in 1967. And um, you know, at that point, American Jews become very excited, very excited about um, the, the, the sort of the drama of, of the Israeli um, sort of uh, struggle for independence. And as, as American Jews become, you know, focus more attention and become more involved with um, Israel and Israeli politics, um, it's kind of very natural for them. You know, if I, if I can refer back to um, sort of a, uh, a dynamic that that has persisted in in lots of of tendencies within the Zionist movement. There's this constant push and pull between different Zionist leaders uh, over this question of the Jewish state. Which part of that formula is more important? Is it more important that the Jewish state be Jewish, or is it more important that it be just that it be a state? For somebody like Ben Gurion, it was always much more important that it be a state. Um, the, its its Jewish identity was 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 largely incidental. Not that, that he didn't care about Jews, but that he didn't care that that the state had any sort of connection to Jewish tradition or to Jewish particular dimensions of Jewish culture. He just wanted the state to be powerful so that it could protect Jews from anti semites. Um, but as American Jews get involved with Israel, um, they tend 
you know, I think very naturally to be more concerned with the Jewish part of the Jewish state. And that's because of our existential situation, right? As Americans, we're geographically and, and culturally alienated from Israel, um, but we relate to it as Jews. So for, for American Jews, I think that what it's really important to them that Israel be Jewish and that it manifests different aspects of Jewish tradition. So that uh, for a, a lot of American Jews, the, the way that they express their Zionist sentiments um, and the way that they participate in Zionist politics tends to mirror a lot of the ideas of, of religious Zionism. Now, that being said, you know, there's of course religious Zionism and there's religious Zionism. And, you know, what happens and what we're going to see is that if you, if you, if you espouse a kind of religious Zionism, then the nature of your Zionism changes or uh, is inflected by the nature of your religious commitments. And um, certain types of theology lend themselves to um, certain types of religious activism. And uh, the, in many ways, uh, the, the most influential forms of religious Zionism today, and the ones that, that have the most um, profound political impact Inter, not just within Israel itself, but internationally, don't really stem either from the diaspora or from uh, the, the movements uh, that, that trace themselves back to somebody like um, uh, Rabbi Jacob Reins. The, 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 the types of Zionism that, that are making the most waves today and that are most, um, that, that have the greatest impact on current events have their source in, in two um, wellsprings. One of them is this man, Abraham Isaac Cook. Um, Cook uh, was an enormously influential figure in the early 20th century. Um, he was uh, a, a, a rabbi originally born in Eastern Europe, moved to Palestine um, in the early days of the Zionist movement. He was elected chief rabbi of um, the Yeshuv, the, the, the the kind of Jewish um, uh, self-governing uh, authority that had been set up under the British mandate in 1921. Um, he was a very accomplished theologian, a, commentary, a commentator on halakha, a mystic, a poet. Um, he's one of these guys who sort of breaks all boundaries and, 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 and defies all sorts of conventional um, uh, uh, classifications. Um, and he was an extraordinarily charismatic figure. Um, he attracted uh, an ardent following. And in his writings and in his theology, he took religious Zionism to a kind of a, 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 another level. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. First of all, I, I, if you want to learn more about Rav Cook and what I've, so much of the information I'm presenting to you here is I, I I glean from this book by Yehuda uh, Mirsky uh, that it's a biography. This series for, by Yale, Jewish Lives, is really wonderful. And I've, I've referred to several of the volumes in this series. This is one of them. So um, this is one of, one of um, Cook's writings, uh, Lights for Rebirth. If a Jewish secular nationalism were really imaginable, then we would indeed be in danger of falling so low as to be beyond redemption. But Jewish secular nationalism is a form of self-delusion. The spirit of Israel is so closely linked to the spirit of God that a Jewish nationalist, and here this is, I've added these italics, no matter how secularist his intentions may be, must, despite himself, affirm the divine. The secularist will thus be constrained to realize that they are immersed and rooted in the life of God and bathed in the radiant sanctity that comes from above. So, you know, there's, there's a certain degree of parallelism between Cook's position and that of Jacob Reigns, but he's taken it a step further. He's not just saying that um, Zionism is compatible with religious life. 
what he's asserting very, very audaciously and very, very militantly is that, Zion, that religious life is not compatible with anything but Zionism. That, you know, not only is he saying that Zionists are not heretics, what he's saying is, if you're hunched over your Torah and you're studying Talmud and you say you're not a Zionist, you're kidding yourself. You're the heretic, not me. Um, you know, he, he looks at, at, at uh, Talmud and Torah and Kabbalah and he says, yep, it is, it is the destiny of all Jews to, um, to, to lend their support to the Zionist movement. And, and you know, the flip side of that, what, he, what he's saying here very, very provocatively is that somebody like Ben-Gurion, Ben-Gurion may not know that he is carrying out the will of God, but that doesn't change the fact that he's doing it anyway. Right? I mean, what, what, what Cook is saying is that somebody like Ben-Gurion who thinks he's an atheist, he's kidding himself too, because if he's out there working to create a Jewish state, then he's in effect a religious Jew. He's, he's carrying out a mission that's ordained by Torah. And even if he thinks he's a secularist, even if he thinks he's an atheist, well, he, he's, he's, he's going to find out in due time just how wrong he is. So this is a really, and you know, this is a very militant uh, uh, position. And you can see, you know, for young people, I always think of, you know, young uh, Orthodox men you know, teenagers who are living, living in the yeshuv uh, in the early 1920s, this, you could see what the appeal of this message would be, right? That, that yeah, you know, this guy is really speaking my language, you know? Um, and so he, he has a, a small but, but ardent group of followers who um, uh, subscribe to, to this, um, you know, very, very almost kind of mystical sense of what Zionism is all about. Um, the, the other wellspring that, that um, the most influential forms of religious Zionism today um, uh, emerge from is this event in 1948, the Kfar Etzion massacre. Uh, Kfar Etzion uh, is a village um, on the outskirts of, of Jerusalem. Uh, it fell outside of the, 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 the realm of the um, uh, the UN partition plan of 1947. So if the, if the partition plan um, uh, had been followed, it would, it would not have fallen, or if the partition plan remained in effect today, let's say, uh, it would not be within the boundaries of the state of Israel. Um, and in fact, um, you know, as the independence war breaks out in 1948, uh, ben Gurion and the other leaders of the um, uh, the Haganah and what would eventually became the Israeli Defense Forces said, "Well, look, uh, we ca we cannot defend this perimeter." Um, they they asked the the settlers at Kfar Etzion to um, evacuate. Kfar Etzion had been settled by a group of religious Zionists. Um, there had been several different attempts to to settle Kfar Etzion by religious Zionists. Um, over decades, beginning in the, uh, the early decades of the 20th century. Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the location was attractive to uh, religious Zionists because it fell close to Jerusalem. It was near the holy sites. So um, the, the, the settlers were reluctant to leave. They sent away um, the women and the children, most of the women and the children, uh, but they remained and they, and they uh, remained with a group of armed defenders to try and resist the um, advance of the Arab Legion, the, the army that um, uh, invaded um, the, um, the, the, the Jewish yeshuv after the, um, the partition of 1948. And um, uh, the, the, there were about 180 defenders in Kfar Etzion. There were some adults who had remained behind, um, adult women, elderly people. Um, they were all, all but three of them were killed. Um, the, uh, the, the, you know, the accounts differ, but it seems clear that um, uh, the, at some point the, the, the defenders and, and the remaining settlers of Kfar Etzion were very deliberately massacred. Um, 
Some accounts say that this was done in um, revenge for um, a, a massacre that had been um, perpetrated by members of the, the uh, Irgun and the Stern gang at a place called Der Yassin. Um, this is a photo of two of the surviving um, defenders who were uh, taken into custody by the, the Arab Legion after the, uh, after the massacre. And um, uh, the, the, the reason that the, the event became so significant in the history of religious Zionism um, is because uh, the uh, survivors, the children who had been sent away by Kfar Etzion, um, they eventually, many of them gravitated to the leadership of this man, Rabbi Tzvi Yehuda Cook. He was um, uh, Isaac Cook's son, and he continued upon his father's theology. So the Cooks became an, uh, a rabbinic dynasty. And Tzvi Yehuda Cook, um, you know, continued his father's sort of interpretation of the relationship between Torah and Zionism, and even intensified it. So here's an example. This, this is actually, well, here's an example of his writings. 19 years ago, so this is, this is uh, Tzvi Yehuda Cook writing in, in 1967. This is interesting. He, this is him writing just before the Six Day War. Um, and he, he writes, 19 years ago on the night when news of the United Nations decision in favor of the reestablishment of the state of Israel reached us, when the people streamed into the streets to celebrate and rejoice, I could not go out and join in the jubilation. I could not accept the fact that indeed they have divided my land. Where is our Hebron? Where is our Shechem, our Jericho? Where have we forgotten them? Have we the right to give up even one grain of the land of God? So, uh, you know, for, for Tzvi Yehuda Cook, it's not just a matter of um, the, that Zionism is compatible with Torah or that Zionism is the fulfillment of Torah. It's a specific kind of Zionism. And for him, the, the Zion that has to emerge from this movement has to conform to the parameters of the biblical kingdom of Israel. Um, you know, Tel Aviv is nothing. Jerusalem, Shechem, Jericho, those places are everything. And, you know, the movement that, 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 that's um, coalesced around him was galvanized and electrified by the events of the Six Day War. So if I go back to the photo, you'll notice in the photo, this is Tzvi Yehuda Cook standing with Israeli paratroopers at the Wailing Wall. Um, you know, he was living in, in, in the Israeli part of Jerusalem at the time. Uh, as soon as he heard that the Temple Mount and the, and the Wailing Wall had been captured by Israeli soldiers, he rushed within an hour of the fall of that territory to Israeli defense forces. He was at the wall davening with uh, members of the Israeli army who were, who were on the scene. So this really galvanizes um, the movement that had, that had coalesced, that had crystallized around him. And, you know, in the wake of the, 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 the Six Day War, the Israeli army um, ends up in, in, in possession of hundreds of square miles of territory that is inhabited by a majority of, of, of Arab residents. And, you know, I think that it's, it's, a, it's fairly well attested by the sources that the initial expectation of the Israeli leadership and the Israeli military high command was that most, if not all of this territory was going to be repatriated to Jordan or Syria um, uh, almost immediately, right? Because the, 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 the idea that the, the, that an, a military occupation was going to um, uh, continue for years, or if not decades, uh, was not something that that um, anyone in the Israeli leadership um, uh, was enthusiastic about. But of course, and there were lots of reasons that that have nothing to do with the agenda of religious Zionists for why the the those initial expectations of the Israeli leadership didn't didn't pay out, that why it was, it was difficult to um, disengage from the occupation. But um, the group that becomes most enthusiastic about the occupation, especially of East Jerusalem and the West Bank, is this group 
that grows up around um, Tzvi Yehuda Kuk. And um, the, the followers of Tzvi Yehuda Kuk, the, 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 nuclear, the nucleus of which are um, survivors of the Kfaret Zion massacre, and survivors in the sense of children whose parents had been killed at Tzvaret Zion, um, uh, forms into this uh, political organization known as the Gush Emunim. And uh, the Gush Emunim become uh, very, very active in pursuing um, the establishment of Jewish settlements in East Jerusalem and the West Bank. Um, this is this is um, one of the um, publications of their uh, their periodic journal. Um, you can see the the cover photo is of um, uh, settlers uh, at a place called Elon More, interacting with members of the Israeli army. The first settlement that they established uh, was at a place known as Ofra. I don't know if anyone can um, see. Um, my um, uh, uh, cursor, but I'm, I'm pointing at Ofra there, okay. Um, and uh, in 19, after the Yom Kippur War, a group of uh, Gush Emunim settlers um, during the first um, uh, term of um, Yitzhak Rabin as prime minister, um, they moved, you know, very suddenly moved into Ofra. They chose Ofra for two reasons. One was that there was an abandoned uh, Jordanian military base there that they could use for shelter. The other reason they chose Ofra was that you can see it's about midway <laughs> between the Jordan River and what's known as the Green Line. So it's right in the heart of the West Bank. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, the, this group of young uh, Gush Emunim activists moved into this Jordanian military base. They began um, building um, permanent houses for themselves and establishing infrastructure. Um, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin was faced with a choice. Um, he could send the Israeli military in and eject them, um, or uh, uh, you know, he could tolerate their presence there. Um, he was told by some of his advisors that this would, you know, having a, a Jewish military eject, ejecting Jewish settlers would be politically um, uh, dangerous. So he kind of uh, caved in. Um, and that became the first settlement. It's grown. It's the largest settlement to this day. Oh, do I not? I don't have a, I don't have a picture of Ofra today. But if you, if you look up Ofra online, the pictures of it's a, it's, it's a town of something like 20,000 residents. It's grown um, to be um, a, 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 an enormous presence smack dab in the middle of the West Bank. And it's only one of dozens of settlements like it that have been established by the Gush Emunim over time. So that, you know, at this point, um, uh, the, you know, and the Gush Emunim no longer, they, 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 they disbanded as a group, but the movement itself remains robust and, um, there's something like 350,000 um, uh, Jewish Israelis resident in different parts of the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Um, and, you know, this is really one of, one of the main reasons that a two-state solution remains elusive. Um, you know, if you, if you decide that the West Bank is going to be a new Palestinian state and the Israeli army is going to withdraw, well, all of a sudden, all of these Jews living in Ofra um, are living without the protection of the Israeli army. And, um, you know, as much as the, the Palestinian Authority would, would, would swear that they, they, don't mean, they don't mean any harm to the people of Ofra, there are extremists on the Palestinian side who would take advantage of the um, uh, withdrawal of the Israeli army to, um, you know, target settlers all over the West Bank um, with, for, um, uh, with violence. So, um, you know, I, I wanna talk about a couple of, so, and, and of course the Gush Emini movement is, one could say, well, they're, they're an extreme wing of the um, religious Zionist movement, but they're far from the most extreme wing, right? So that, um, 
uh, among the extremists, uh, Gush Emunim sort of represents moderates. And um, moving, moving on from there, there's this um, uh, figure, Yehuda Etzion. Yehuda Etzion, if you look him up online, uh, when you see him photographed for um, journalists, he's almost always photographed with uh, the, uh, the Dome of the Rock or the Al-Aqsa Mosque in the background. And the reason that is, is because um, he formed a splinter group of the, um, uh, the, the Gush Emani movement called, that called themselves the Jewish Underground. And in the 1980s, uh, he and his colleagues tried to uh, fill the Al-Aqsa Mosque. They had, they had a plot to um, wire the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock with dynamite so that they could be blown up. Uh, you know, why blow up the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the, uh, the Dome of the Rock? Well, if you do that, then uh, you're free to rebuild the Temple of Solomon. And, you know, this is, and, and Yehuda Etzion himself, you know, he swears up and down, he's a gentleman. He, you know, one of the reasons that he and his Confederates got captured is they were adamant that they were gonna do this in a way that was not gonna kill civilians. And, uh, you know, um, but, uh, uh, you know, th this is a kind of pattern that, that sort of repeats itself in a lot of um, religious political activism, you know, whether we're talking about a group like the Jewish underground or Al Qaeda, right? Why, why, why destroy the World Trade Centers? Why um, dynamite a, a, an ancient um, work of art like the, the, the giant Buddhas of Bamiyan? Um, why destroy the, 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 um, the Dome of the Rock? You know, if you destroy the Dome of the Rock, one thing that I think it's fair to say will never happen is that the, the temple is never going to be rebuilt. The only thing you would accomplish by um, setting dynamite to the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque is to set off waves of violence around the world that would take hundreds, if not thousands, perhaps even millions of lives as you know, Muslims all over the world became outraged at this offense to their one of their most sacred shrines. So, you know, but for, from the perspective of somebody like Yehuda Etzion, well, why does he contemplate doing it? Because he believes God wants it done. And if, if you believe this is God's will, you don't really have to worry about what's gonna happen after you do it. God will, God will dispose, right? God will take care of the rest. What's gonna happen after we destroy the World Trade Center? Well, that's God's problem. Let's knock it down. God will make sure that everything happens as it should after that. Um, and so this is this is one of the the, the patterns that we see um, expressing itself in some of the more extreme precincts of religious Zionism. Another example of this, oh, the, and Yehud Etzion. If you're interested in Yehud Etzion, he's one of the key figures in this book by Yossi Klein Halevi. One of the things that's interesting about Yehud Etzion is that. He was a member of the paratroopers. He was part of the paratroop unit that first liberated um, Jerusalem, uh, East Jerusalem, uh, liberated, uh, that, that first occupied East Jerusalem. So uh, he's, he's outlined um, in great detail in this book, Yossi Klein Halevi. In, in Like Dreamers, Yossi Klein Halevi follows several members of the, um, the paratroop unit that um, first uh, occupied the area um, of the, the, the Western Wall. And uh, one of the figures that he outlines in that book, and he, he follows their lives from before the Six Day War and all the way up until the publication of the book in the, uh, in, in the beginning of the 21st century. Um, so it's an interesting read. Another example of this extreme tendency in religious Zionism is Yigal Amir. Many of you may have heard of him. He's the man who assassinated Yitzhak Rabin. Um, and again, you know, why shoot Yitzhak Rabin? When I, when I heard of the murder of Yitzhak Rabin, I, I thought a Jew did this, um, but it was a Jew and it was, you know, Yigal Amir, he wasn't, it doesn't, he wasn't particularly tied into um, any uh, discreet 
religious Zionist organization. He'd gone to B'nai Akiva uh, camps and schools, and uh, he had co actually come under the influence by an even more radical wing of religious Zionism, the Kahani Chai. Uh, you know, no, no, no organization seems to have ordered him to do this, but again, he thought, well, God wants Yitzhak Rabin dead because Yitzhak Rabin is, is planning to uh, create a two-state solution which would foil God's intentions. Um, and so, you know, he shot this man who is arguably, you know, one of the great heroes of modern Jewish history. Um, uh, and, and, and again, the, the justification being, well, uh, you know, in all other respects, it might seem wrong, but it's what God wants. So, all right, and, I, and forgive me if this, if this presentation is a bit disjointed. That's sort of the end of my discussion of religious Zionism. And we can, we can go back if there are things that people want to talk about during, during um, the, the discussion afterwards. But I'm moving on very abruptly. I'm going to be talking now about Christian Zionism, which in some sense is sort of a parallel phenomenon to religious Zionism. I mean, it's another, it's another form of religious Zionism. Um, and one, the, that the theological basis of which is different. Um, and Christian Zionism, you know, I, I first became aware of it as a teenager. I was, I was flipping around um, channels on uh, the television and I came across this paid announcement by Jerry Falwell's group, the, the Moral Majority. Um, and they, they had put together this kind of long paid infomercial uh, the, the, the title of which was just Jerusalem, but in their logo, in the, the title, the word, the letters USA in Jerusalem were raised. So the suggestion being that Jerusalem and the USA were somehow connected. And the connection they were drawing was that, um, and, and this is sort of very, very standard um, within the theology of this Christian Zionist movement was that um, it was very, very important for the United States to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital and for the United States to move its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, and their, their belief being that this would be one important step in a, um, a series of events that according to their reading of scripture, would help hasten the second coming of Jesus Christ. Um, and that's sort of the, the basis of Christian Zionism. There's, there, there are various strains of Christian theology going back. This book that I, I relied upon, and you know, that, that, that infomercial made me aware of um, the, the kind of the intensity and the depth of Christian Zionism in um, contemporary American politics. I only really became aware of the depth and breadth and intensity of the history of Christian Zionism, reading Donald Lewis's book, The Short History of Christian Zionism. The book is something like 350 pages long. That's a short history. Um, but he, he, he goes into the history of Christian, Christian Zionism. He goes all the way back to Roman times uh, because that's how far one back has, one has to go uh, in order to sort of trace the origins of this theological uh, proposition that that's uh, very salient in many different precincts of Christianity today, the idea that um, the return of Jews to the Holy Land and the reestablishment of a Jewish kingdom, uh, the end of the diaspora, in effect, uh, are one of the precursors of the second coming of Jesus, that Jesus will only return after um, uh, the Jewish kingdom has been reestablished in, in the Holy Land. Um, and this, th this idea has been kicking around in different uh, parts of, of the, the Christian world for a long time. It was very influential among some of the early leaders, it, some of the leaders of, of the British Empire at the time when the early Zionist leaders were active. So leaders like Theodore Herzl and Chaim Weizmann, um, they knew that British politicians like Lord Balfour um, and Lloyd George uh, subscribed to this theology and they used the, that fact th to their advantage that lots of early Zionist leaders um, appealed to these theological ideas in their interaction with, um, 
European um, politicians lobbying on behalf of the Zionist movement. Um, so Christian Zionism has been, been a kind of a robust and, a, and an influential force in Zionism more generally since the earliest inception of the movement. Uh, you know, and if you, if you Google around and if you, you sort of look over the internet, uh, Christian Zionism is a robust movement today. This is, um, these are images I took from um, a, a, a report on a gathering of Christian Zionists in Bethlehem. I, if I remember correctly, and I, it's been a while since I put this PowerPoint together. These two people pictured here are Dutch, right? Um, and uh, these are British Christian Zionists. They may be, th these may be taken from the same parade uh, but it's it, similarly, this is an event with, of Christian Zionists from around the globe that's being hosted um, in, in Bethlehem, in, in Israel. And, uh, you know, here in the United States, um, the Christian Zionists can be counted among some of the most influential leaders of um, uh, Protestant uh, Christianity, particularly. Um, the, you know, what, what's generally known as sort of the Christian right, politically active um, uh, people whose, whose uh, political activism is deeply interwoven with their Christianity, the correlation between that and a commitment to Christian Zionism is very, very high. So to give you some examples of prominent Christian Zionists, um, this man, James Hagee, um, here he is at an event of an organization that he founded, Christians United for Israel. Uh, you can see he's, he's shaking Mike Pence's hand. You may have heard of James Hagee. He was one of the, the ministers who gave the benediction at the dedication of the new American embassy in Jerusalem that had been um, established by the Trump administration. Um, here's uh, Benjamin Netanyahu addressing uh, a meeting of James Hagee's Christians United for Israel. You can see Netanyahu at the podium. James Hagee um, listening. Uh, so just some examples of the writings of Christian Zionists here in the US. So one very prominent Christian Zionist is Pat Robertson. Uh, this is from an essay he wrote called Why Evangelicals Support Israel. We believe that the emergence of a Jewish state in the land promised by God to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob was ordained by God. We believe that God has a plan for this nation, which he intends to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. The slogan, land for peace, is a cruel chimera. The world's Christians ask that you do not give away the treasured symbols of your spiritual patrimony. So, you know, this expresses um, a feeling on the part of Christian Zionists that, you know, they, they agree with people like Yehuda Etzion uh, and, and Rabbi Tzvi Yehuda Cook. The, what matters about the land of Israel or the, the, the Israeli state is that it occupied the territory that is included in the kingdom of, of, of David and Solomon in the Bible. So Tel Aviv is a profane place. Jerusalem, Shechem, Shiloh, those are the places that matter. And so establishing a Palestinian state within a, in, in a place like the West Bank or East Jerusalem is anathema to Christian Zionists. They're very much opposed to a two-state solution. This is from a sermon that James Hagee gave in 2005. Theodore Herzl is the father of Zionism. He was a Jew that at the turn of the 19th century said, this is our land, God wants us to live there. Herzl never said anything like it, right? Herzl, Herzl was a, a very, very much a sec secularist. Those who came founded Israel, those who did not went through the hell of the Holocaust. How did it happen? Because God allowed it to happen. Why did it happen? Because God said, my top priority for the Jewish people is to get them to come back to the land of Israel. Now, this of course is, is ghastly from the perspective of Jews, this idea that, oh, why did, why did God allow the Holocaust to happen? It was all some kind of ruse to get Jews to return to the Holy Land. Um, but again, you know, if your if your if your politics is is rooted in 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 theology, um, this this kind of proposition has its own sort of internal logic. Um, 
And, you know, one has to keep in mind that these people have the ears of our nations here in the United States, I should say, our nation's highest leaders, people like Hagee, people like Robertson. Um, they are in constant contact with senators, presidents, um, and, you know, they have disproportionate influence on all dimensions of, of, of policy, um, including foreign policy. So, all right, I mean, this is another very abrupt transition. And I realize I've gone on much too long already. I've, I've spoken for almost an hour. So I'm gonna rush through the last part of my presentation here, which is on this third form of nationalism, binationals, not Zionism. And uh, one of the early leaders of binational Zionism is this man, Arthur Ruppen. Ruppen was a banker. Um, he secured some of the, the key loans that were instrumental in things like the construction of the, the port of Tel Aviv. So he's a, a, a very prominent figure in the, the founding generations of the Israeli, of the, of the Jewish yeshuv in, in Palestine. And the thing about Ruppin is that, you know, from very early on, you can see he dies before the actual partition, the founding of the state of Israel. But he was very active in the politics of the yeshuv. And um, in uh, 1921, he founded this organization called Brit Shalom, uh, you know, Covenant of Peace. And the, uh, the, the, the politics, and he, he was able to, Brit Shalom was a, a small group. Um, they were pretty marginal, but he was able to attract um, the participation of some of the most prominent intellectuals um, that were living in the yeshiva at the time, Martin Buber, Gershon Sholem. Um, and this is um, a, uh, 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 a segment of their mission statement from 1925. A Jewish national home is only worthwhile if it is built upon a basis which provides for absolute justice for both Jew and Arab. Palestine should be neither an Arab state nor a Jewish state, but a biracial state, I put sick there because they're, they're speaking in terms of race, even though Jew, Jews and Arabs aren't really racial groups, right? Um, but a biracial state in which Jew and Arab have equal rights without domination of the one by the other. Although Jews and Arabs will always have separate religious, cultural, and national organization, there should be joint administrative, economic, and social organization. So, you know, this, this was a, you know, some might call this a, a somewhat utopian ideal, uh, but again, it did have the support of very prominent intellectuals. One of the intellectuals who, who, who lent its support, he never really joined the organization, but Albert Einstein. Uh, Einstein was kind of an, an interesting figure. At one point, he was uh, undoubtedly the most famous Zionist in the world. And he was really, uh, you know, a, in the, by the 19 teens, 1920s, he was the most famous Jew in the world. He was internationally well known for his um, theory of relativity. Um, and when Chaim Weizmann converted him to be a spokesman for the Zionist movement, it was an enormous coup. Uh, what some of the excerpts I'm gonna give you, if you're interested in his politics, this book, Einstein on Politics, gives you um, excerpts of his political writings. He was a really, a voluminous writer on politics. He was a very non-ideological person, but for someone who didn't really have a, a concrete ideology, he wrote a great deal about politics. So here's a, a, a photograph of him with uh, Chaim Weizmann on a fundraising trip to New York in 1921. Uh, and on that same trip, he wrote, he wrote this editorial uh, on internationalism. Humanity is suffering from too much and too narrow a conception of nationalism. The present wave of nationalism, which at the slightest provocation or without provocation passes over into chauvinism is a sickness. This is him writing in 19, this is very early. Um, you know, sometimes uh, if you Google Einstein, you get this apocryphal quote by him, which I, I, I suspect he never actually said or wrote that nationalism is the measles of the mind. Uh, I don't know that he ever used rhetoric quite that colorful, but here he, he is saying explicitly nationalism is a sickness. And of course, this is in the wake of World War I. Um, he was not the only intellectual in the world um, who, who had gone off of nationalism. 
uh, lots of people looked at the horrors of World War One and, and said, concluded, well, nationalism is, is just, it's a sickness, it's, it's, it's an evil. But uh, Einstein really maintained this pretty much to the end of his life. And his, his anti-nationalist feelings um, uh, really intensified, you know, as World War I uh, gave way to World War II and as the Nazi party rose and anti-Semitism drove him out of Europe, um, he became more and more convinced that nationalism was the wrong way to go. So it's interesting, he's less of a binational Zionist and, and he was always in some sense more of a non-national Zionist, uh, which is you know, in itself almost a kind of contradiction in terms. Um, here's an excerpt from testimony that he gave to the Anglo-American Commission of uh, 1946. So this is just prior to the UN partition of, uh, of Palestine. And, you know, the, the, these American and British uh, officials were taking testimony from prominent Jewish intellectuals on, you know, what, what should be the policy of the UN? Should the UN uphold the Balfour Declaration and create a kind of Jewish homeland in Palestine? So the, the questioner asked Dr. Einstein, what is your attitude toward the idea of a Jewish state as versus a cultural center? Einstein, I was never in favor of a state. The state idea is not according to my heart. I cannot understand why it is needed. It is connected with many difficulties and the narrow mindedness. I believe it is bad. So here he is, you know, uh, you know, 25 years after 1921, he still is ardent, even more ardent and anti-nationalist as he ever was. And, you know, um, he, he sort of backpedaled off of this after Israel was, was founded. Um, he, he eventually lent his verbal support to the Israeli state, but um, he was offered the presidency of Israel, and he declined it. And he declined, I think, on, on these convictions that nationalism is wrong. Um, so the Brit Shalom sort of fell apart. Um, it was, it was, it, it disintegrated in the face of uh, massive Arab Jewish violence in uh, 1936. But it came back. Um, uh, Martin Buber, very famous Jewish philosopher, teamed up with um, a, an American Jewish reform rabbi, Rabbi Judah Magnus, um, to sort of reestablish the Brit Shalom movement. Um, they were joined by Henrietta Zold, um, who's famous as the founder of Hadassah, um, who all her life was a binational Zionist. She had been an early supporter of Brit Shalom, and she joined with Buber and Magnus. And they founded this group called Ehud. Ehud means unity. Um, this is a publication that they put out in 1947, just before the UN partition. Um, the, the, the headline says, stop firing or cease fire. And you can see it shows an Arab and a Jew meeting in the middle of the fields to make peace with one another. So Ehud is dedicated to the same sort of, here, I'll, I think I have a, a mission statement, uh, Arab Jewish unity. This is an essay co-written, a manifesto co-written by Judah Magnus and Martin Buber in 1947. The Arabs say that the existence of the Jewish national home bars the way to the attainment by the Arabs of Palestine of national status. That is so. On the other hand, the binational Palestine would deprive the Jews of their one chance of a Jewish state, but this bi binational Palestine would be the one state in the world where they would be a constituent nation that is an equal, an equal nationality within the body politic and not a minority as everywhere else. Now, you know, the position of Magnus and, and Buber is that everyone's giving something up. The Jews would like to have their own national homeland, their own state. Um, Arab, the Palestinian Arabs would like to have their own nation state. Um, but the only real just solution, um, the only practical solution is to create a state that they could both share um, and in which each of them would be a, a constituent nationality. What that means is left rather vague, but um, this is the idea of, of, of a binational state. And, you know, one thing to, to sort of keep in mind is that this, this idea of binational Zionism has never really gone away. And, it, and it's, it's been growing in intensity and it's been growing in currency in recent decades. 
This was a, a, an essay that made a lot of waves. Tony Jute, a famous historian, died in 2010. Um, he wrote this essay um, that was published in the New York uh, Review of Books uh, called uh, Israel, the Alternative. The time has come to think the unthinkable. The two-state solution is probably already doomed. The true alternative facing the Middle East in coming years will be between an ethnically cleansed greater Israel and a single integrated binational state of Jews and Arabs, Israelis and Palestinians. The very idea of a binational state, binational state is an unpromising mix of realism and utopia, but the alternatives are far, far worse. So, you know, Tony, if you go and you read the entire essay, Judas tr trying to be a realist, he's saying, look, is a binational state going to be easy to achieve? Will it involve uh, misery and hardship and violence? Yes, it will. But the alternatives are worse, that, that simply allowing the status quo to continue until it collapses um, is just not, not thinkable. Right? If, 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 if a two-state solution has, has genuinely receded out of reach, the only other uh, practical solution is a binational state. And, um, you know, this is... This is a position that you hear more and more of by different intellectuals uh, and political leaders, and, and it's one that you're going to hear more and more of uh, as time goes by. Um, and I'll confess, I mean, I'll, I'll full disclosure, I, I think that my, my personal evolution as a, as a Zionist has, has followed Tony Jutes. Uh, I would, like him, I would much prefer a two-state solution, but if we've gotten to a point which looks increasingly the case that a two-state solution is impossible, well, the only, the only practical and just solution is, is a binational one. So I, I, wanna, I wanna close, but I wanna, the last thing is to, that, you know, in all of my discussion, one group that I've, I've largely left out are the Palestinians. And the one thing that I would underscore here is that, you know, I, I, I don't, expect anyone to have any particular opinions about the, the, the Arab-Israeli conflict, but that, you know, one thing that, that one can't deny is that Palestinian nationalism is a fact. Um, one can protest all one likes that, well, there was no such thing as a Palestinian nation if one goes back 100 years, if one goes back 150 years. The problem with those kinds of arguments is that they apply to almost to vastly more than half of the current nation states on earth. Nationalism is a new phenomenon. Um, nation states are new kinds of political communities. There were no, virtually no nation states anywhere in the world before about 1750. And you know we've gotten to the point where the world is divided between 190 some odd nation states through a very sort of contingent and sometimes arbitrary process. You know, if you had went back 100, 200 years ago, would anyone be able to predict that there would be a nation of Tuvalu or a nation of Kiribati? No. <laughs> so if the Palestinians say they're a nation, then they have as much basis for that belief as anybody else. And we, we really can't just wish it away. Um, so, you know, I mean, and my point here is that Judah Magnus and Martin Buber writing, you know, 70 years ago were right. You know, they would, it, it, a binational solution would be one in which they were giving something up. They believe they're a nation. And if we have a binational state, well, not only would Jews be giving something up, the Palestinians would be giving something up too. And there are Palestinian leaders who are ready to do that. So I'm gonna give the last word to a Palestinian politician. This is uh, Saeb Erekat, who died in 2020. Um, but he's a, a Palestinian minister of parliament, was for the, the, the city of Jericho. Palestinians must refocus their attention on the one state solution where Muslims, Christians, and Jews can live as equals. It is very serious. This is the moment of truth for us. There are Palestinian leaders who are ready to say, okay, you know what? We can't have a, a sovereign Palestine. Let's all join together. Right, let's all let's let's have a binational state. Um, and again, I think that more and more one is going to see um, voices on both sides of the issue um, uh, proposing that kind of solution. I'll stop there. I, I realize I've gone too long, but uh, 
I'm happy to to entertain any any discussion that anyone wants to have. All right. If anyone has a question, feel free. I think to shout it out. There's enough. Uh, there's not a lot of people, so it's okay. So, Larry, I think you had a question. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate the comment you made about American Jews that for so many American Jews, interpreting the past is linked with the religious component so that when you've cited, you know, the stained glass window with Moses and David and Solomon, and then you go to, uh, again, Herzl and Weizmann and, and, and uh, Ben-Gurion, we have that link. I'm curious, uh, just to really bring up the one side from the American side, the other from Israel side, I wonder if you think the primary reason for that is that for most American Jews who want to perpetuate the connection with Jewish life and for their children, that the way they do that is when it comes time to when their children start to grow, they say, well, we have to link with Jewish life. We go to the synagogue, you go to Hebrew school, you get bar bat mitzvah. And that's so that the link is there and that's that natural start with the, the religious component and then it links to Israel. And I wanted to ask you that side of it, because there could be other institutional forces that ultimately could lead someone to a, be a Zionist, but that you think that may be a primary reason on that side. And perhaps I'd ask you the other side. Uh, you look at Israel where there still are so many secular Jews. And I wonder for someone born as a sovereign who speaks the Hebrew language, which is except as for religious reasons was a dead language for hundreds and thousands of years is alive again and it's a language they speak and they drink water and they work the soil and they walk in the path of places that are in the bible even if these people don't follow it from a religious point of view that there's a definite feeling that they are jews and that this is their land i'm wondering if that I, I threw a lot of things out there but i like to do that just to get a response thank you oh that's great i mean um you know I, I think that um, there's not much that you said that I would disagree with. I think part of what's happening, you know, for, for, for Jews here in the United States, and of course, Jews here in the United States are very diverse, but, you know, I, I, I can speak from my own personal experience, right? I, I grew up among non-Orthodox Jews. Um, my, I, I, I was bar mitzvah in a reform temple, my, my family, um, and I, after I was married, uh, we belonged to a conservative temple. But I think that for, for Jews who are, um, you know, less observant, let's say, right? Um, you know, Israel, in a sense, almost becomes a kind of proxy for their, for their Jewish identity, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're not going to temple that often, <laughs> and you're not keeping kosher at home, say, right? Um, that, you know, being an ardent supporter of Israel and being an ardent, being ardently involved in um, in Israeli politics or in, in in American policy towards Israel um, becomes a way of sort of exercising your Jewish identity. And what I think I, what I think sometimes gets gets lost in that, or or what people don't realize, is that you know for a lot of Israeli Jews, um, their their Jewish identity and their Israeli identity aren't really religious, right? That, that, you know, for somebody like Ben-Gurion, Ben-Gurion really didn't care yeah. whether the Wailing Wall was part of Israel or not. And for him, it was like, give us a defensible territory, give us the resources we need to keep people safe and to keep them fed. That's all we need. He would have been just as happy to have Israel anywhere, as long as, you know, you know for him, Tel Aviv and, 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 and Jerusalem were indistinguishable. You know, now on the other hand, you know, and I, I remember reading, um, there's a there's a book by Thomas Friedman called- um, From Beirut uh, to Jerusalem? Beirut to Jerusalem, yes. And he interviews, uh, and I'm, now I'm forgetting, he's a famous uh, sort of um, cultural figure in Israel. And I, I I can't remember his name now, but but Friedman interviews him and and, He's a kind of non-Orthodox Jew living in Israel. And one of the things that he tells Friedman is, well, you know, look, one of the great things about being in Israel, and, you know, and, and he interviews him, I think, on Yom Kippur, and all he's doing is sitting around, he's sitting around on Yom Kippur drinking a beer and just asking the people who pass by to forgive him, you know. And 
you know, what he says to uh, to Friedman is like, look, if you're living in Israel, playing basketball is Jewish, right? You don't you don't need you know I don't have to be observant because everything you do in Israel is Jewish. Um, and yeah, I think there's a lot of people who feel that way in Israel. Uh, but you know how that how that inflects their understanding of the um, of the politics is sort of unpredictable, right? I don't know if that 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 that's the response you would you would satisfies you, Larry. Well, I, I could ask you a hundred questions. I can't do that here, but I appreciate everything's wonderful. If, if oh, if I don't know if there's another question, can I ask you a little different yeah, question? Can I me? say something? I'm sorry, it's let Steve. me wait. I can't see. There it. used to be here in Western Monmouth near English Town a training camp for uh, that power uh, the organization you mentioned. Uh, Palo Apoel Hamidrahi. Yes, okay. there was a training camp here. Okay. They even had a Piper plane that they trained people to fly with. Okay. Yeah, it's just interesting. They all ah, have to go to Israel. No, the Zionists were not kidding around. You know, I mean, you know, one of the things is that you know there was, especially at, you know, after World War One, there was this sense of of real seriousness, right? That that anti-Semitism was uh, an existential threat to the Jewish people and that, you know, you were going to have to, uh, Jews were going to have to develop certain assets and skills to evade this trap, right? Um, and, you know, so that, and that, I think you see that appear in lots of different domains of the Zionist movement. Um, you know, just to go back to, to Larry's first um, comment, you know, one thing that I neglected to say in sort of talking about, um, you know, religious Zionists in, in, in relation to Israel is that I think one of the things that sometimes often surprises American Jews is the degree to which so many of the Orthodox in Israel itself are anti-Zionist. Um, you know, if you watch a, a show like Shtisel, yeah. That's a really, you know, and of course it's produced by secular Jews, so you know there may be some bias there. But it's a really interesting depi depiction of, um, you know, the Haredi community, and the Haredi community is this enormous segment of the Jewish population in Israel, all of whom go around talking about Zionism, you know, the way the the Soloveitchiks did, like like Zionists are the devil, um, uh, you know, and that's just sort of an interesting situation to have where. So many of the Jews who are living under the aegis and the protection of the Israeli state fundamentally you know, refuse to assent to um, the, the, the basic principles of its founding. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's an interesting situation. <laughs> yeah, Larry? Yeah, I can't tell if anyone. Well, obviously, one of the issues that's so paramount that's been going on for years is about serving in the Israeli army. And I mean, that's been still an ongoing issue like that. I wanted to ask you another question, which I know you could give a whole lecture on, but just to raise the Sephardic part of it, um, just the influence of maybe Sephardic rabbis and other influential people, anything from that side, just a couple of comments. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, 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 Sephar the Sephardic religious um, community, you know, in the in the early years of the yeshuv and in the early years of um, the Israeli state, um, they were politically pretty marginalized. Um, you know, the 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 Israeli Knesset, you know, until 1977 or so, was largely controlled by this coalition at the center of which were were the different labor Zionist parties, um, who largely had the support of um, moderate um, Ashkenazic. Uh, religious parties like like Hamid Rahi. Um, you know, Menachem Begin, when he took the prime ministership in 1977, did so in this kind of lightning stroke. Uh, and one of the things that he was able to do is galvanize the support of religious um, Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews behind um, his sort of revisionist Zionist, behind the Likud. So that sort of realigned Israeli politics, the the religious Sephardic uh, parties have really, in a sense, you know, completely shifted 
um, the, the, the direction of Israeli politics since 1977. And uh, the Sephardic religious parties gave us people like, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu, all of his, his longevity as prime minister is built upon the foundation of Sephardic religious Zionist support. So, um, you know, that's been a, a very, very significant factor in Israeli politics for the last, you know, 40 yeah. years or so. I'm curious just to think about that, about Benjamin Netanyahu's father, who was the great scholar of, of our time about the Inquisition and all that, if that might have been a link at one point. I don't know. That's an interesting question. It's certainly, it's it's certainly a coincidence, right? Yeah. If nothing else. <laughs> but, and then, yeah. oops, sorry, Harvey Cohen has a question. I see him raising his well, little. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm on my phone. Uh, am I audible? Yes. I, we can hear you, Harvey. Hey, how Thanks. you doing? Oh, uh, uh, hi, Andy. Just a, a footnote to uh, uh, the, the comment a couple of seconds ago. Um, in uh, 2019, the uh, Satmar Rebbe, who is, is based in the United States, uh, uh, famously went to Israel and distributed $5 million in donations to 150 anti-Zionist organizations. Yeah. yeah, the Satmars are one of the, they're, they're, a, they're, a, they're one of the last holdout groups, right? But, um, yeah, I mean, that, that, yeah, Harvey, I'm sorry. Yep. No, 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 that was it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, I mean, um, this, this, I don't know that, that, that re the Haredi community will ever be, you know, the, the, in fact, I'm, I'm willing to predict they'll never be wholly reconciled to um, the existence of the Israeli state. Um, so, you know, I think that that it's just sort of important to keep these things in mind that that when we're dealing with um, you know the Israeli political scene, especially over questions like the territorial boundaries of Israel and things like that, that um, how those things relate to, to Jewish identity and to Jewish religious life get exquisitely complicated, um, and. Uh, so complicated in ways that I think somebody like Pat Robertson or James Hagee is simply unequipped to understand, right? And so like, you know, Jews in a sense have a special onus on them, on, on ourselves, right? To, to sort of keep abreast of these things and try to try to keep the, the level of discourse um, generally well informed. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Meyer? There's no more questions. Well, thank you so much for these great programs. It's very interesting to learn more about Zionism at a more in-depth level. I'm really appreciative of taking the time out and I hope you come and visit the museum soon. I hope everyone does because um, we have a new exhibit out about Rabbi Sally Prezand and our permanent exhibit also is a great tour to have. So I hope everyone is well and enjoys this beautiful weather. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.